on, are you glad to be in the house this morning? Come on, I know it's a little warm in here, but the Holy Spirit's blowing through this place, amen. Come on, how many are thankful that he saved you this morning, that he raised you? Listen, listen, listen. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I say, oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I got saved. I got saved. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Sing highest praises. Highest praises. We say,
your glory is in this house. Lord, your glory fills this place right now. God, we know that you're the victor over all sickness, all disease right now. You're victorious over death, God. In Jesus' name, right now, God, we just pray right now for these needs that are in this house. For those of you who are out in the audience right now, those of you who are watching us online, if you have a need right now, just reach out to our prayer partners. They're standing by right now to pray with each one of you. If you need healing for your body, healing for your mind, healing for your spirit, the answer is in this house right now, amen? His presence is in this place. So let's pray together right now with hands lifted. Heavenly Father, right now, we just give you glory, give you honor and praise today, God, for everything. This is the day that you have made, and Lord, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I pray that you administer healing right now, God, throughout this congregation, throughout this body of believers right now, Jesus, both here and online right now. Minister healing, God, to their bodies. Lord, for those that are struggling with sickness right now, God, minister healing to their minds, God, for those that are struggling with, God, with depression, God, anxiety and fear and doubt. God, minister to their spirits right now for those that are in a dry place, God, that are just looking for answers. Lord, be the answer in their life right now. For we know that you are our victorious King, and we overcome through you and by your Spirit right now. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Amen, amen. Let's continue on our worship right now. Hallelujah. You were always fighting for us, heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your grace, in your name I will bow down. In your presence, fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple. Let your power overflow By your grace I live and breathe to worship you
At the cross the work was finished You were buried in the ground But the grave could not contain you For you were the John chapter 16 verse 33 says in the world you're gonna have trouble this is Jesus's words he says but take heart for I have already overcome the world here's what we're reminding you this morning there's trouble in the world but take heart Jesus has already overcome and I don't know what you're facing I don't know what you're struggling with I don't know what your battle is but take heart take heart Jesus has overcome the world. If you believe that, why don't you just put your hands together and say, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Oh, you can do better than that. He's overcome everything that's coming against you, everything that you're battling, everything that you're facing. Jesus has overcome. One more time, let's just put our hands together and say, thank you, Jesus. You know, sometimes we just need to remind ourselves <laughs> The fact remains, but it's not always present in our minds and in our hearts, but sometimes we just need to take a moment say, you've already overcome. I'm so thankful that you are in the house here today. What an incredible day here at Christian Life Austin. We're so thankful that you're in the house. In fact, why don't you turn to your neighbor right now and just say, you look amazing. I, I don't know what else to say. You look amazing. I got a question for you today. How does it feel to be in church on Sunday? I'm not gonna lie, that was weaker than I anticipated. So, let's try this again. Okay, now you can hear it. How does it feel to be in church on Sunday? Come on, church family. Man, I don't know about you, there's no place I would rather be. Now here's what I do know, it feels better to be in church this service than it did first service. And here's why. Uh, <laughs> For those of you, maybe you, you felt really warm when you first came in. Did you, was it warm when you first came in, anybody? Yeah. Well, we had construction crews accidentally cut the main power line to all three units in, in this chapel um, over the weekend. And so much love to our facilities crew headed up by Jason Kelch, who was here at 6 o'clock this morning when he discovered it, and they worked tirelessly um, through first service to try to get some air back in here. And they, I don't know what they did. They messed with the BR549er and connected a few of those. And, and here we have 
a little bit of air. But I told the first service, I said, um, I mean, it was like 80 degrees in here. I told him, we're preaching a message today. Y'all thought that the, we had a, a mishap with the, the AC units, but the title of my message today is, How Hot Is Hell? And we, I told him we were going to have an interactive message that every time I said the word hell, your chairs were going to rattle and vibrate. We had pyrotechnics, fire was going to shoot up. And then about halfway through the message, you can see the lobby's got AC. It worked real fine, real, real great. Halfway through the message, we were going to kind of move. We were going to switch. Everybody that was in here, we were going to go over to the lobby, and then they were going to come over here so we could just see how great it would be following Jesus, you know, how wonderfully cold heaven's going to be. And then the lobby could see just how hot hell would be. But we're not doing that today. Here's what I do want you to do is if you are a lady, I don't, listen, if you had a wedding scheduled for this coming Friday night, cancel it. Run away. Leave him. No, don't do that. I'm kidding. But postpone it because there is a women's gathering called Glow that is happening on Friday night. And I'm telling you, if you are a lady, do not miss this. I, I know what's going on. I've, I've been privy to a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. And you will you will greatly miss out on a, a wonderful night. Though it's going to be virtual, it's going to be an amazing experience for you. You can sign up. You can get merch all in the lobby. Don't miss your opportunity, ladies, um, to, to grow during this season of your life. And so as we, as we start our time together today, I want you to be an encouragement to somebody next to you. I like to start the sermon off with something encouraging. And so I want you to encourage the person next to you with this phrase. This is going to lift their spirits. It's going to help build their faith. Look at the person next to you and tell them, you are a hot mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, don't you feel better about yourself? Don't you feel encouraged this morning? Husbands, you probably just got just elbowed in the ribs when you said that, but that's okay. The phrase, a hot mess, in the, the 19th century had a little bit different meaning than what it means today. In the 19th century, uh, especially if, if you're familiar with, with the military, a hot mess referred to, to food or the dining hall, right, the mess hall. In, in the 20th century, the term hot mess took on a little bit different meaning, but it still had a, a military meaning. Soldiers that found themselves in battle, like in a, in a battle, in a moment of warfare, they would call that moment, that, that intense moment, they would call it a hot mess. But today, 21st century, things have taken a bit of a turn. And a, a hot mess today can be defined as an attractive disaster. That's going to be the title of my message today, an attractive disaster. Somebody whose life is in obvious disarray, and yet they, they remain somewhat functional. They remain somewhat attractive on the outside. They've created a mess. There's a mess all around them. Everything in their life is a mess, but somehow they are uh, appearing to be functional. They can still show up for work. They can still show up for school. Uh, they, look, they look a lot better on the outside than what their circumstances are. And I think, I think this is where a lot of us live. I think this is what a lot of us do regardless of what's going on at home. For instance, you show up at work. You show up to church with a smile on your face and, oh, praise the Lord, everything's just great, when on the inside, you know what just came out of your mouth does not match what is in your spirit. That on the inside, you are a disaster. But on the outside, everything is okay because you don't want anybody to know what's really going on on the inside. It's the reason that some of you, maybe, uh, maybe if you're new to a church environment, you're unsure if you even like this place because everybody's so happy, they're, so, they're smiling. I want you to look around you. Look, look, uh, just see, yeah, look around you. Good, good, yeah, that's great. Row after row after row. I want to encourage you today. Let, let me be a blessing to you. Row after row after row after row of hot messes. All of us. We've all made a mess of our life from the most holy person in here to the least holy person in here. There are so many hot messes. So welcome. Welcome to church. A place where we're growing 
where we're trying to move in the same direction, where we grow in our faith, where we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But see, what happens is, and I'm going to talk to some church folks today, we, um, we've gotten really, really good at just cleaning up and coming to church. Marriage is falling apart, but when we come to church, man, I love you, baby. Ooh, come on, hold my hand as we walk into church. Business is falling apart. Come on, let's be real this morning. This, this, is, this is where some of us are in life, an attractive disaster. But it's the nature of a hot mess, isn't it? We've all made messes. We've made, we, I think a lot of times we look in the mirror and from one point or, or, in or another in our life, we've all made statements like, I've made a mess of my relationships. I've made a mess of my friendships. I've made a mess of my finances. I've made a mess of my GPA. I've made a mess of my professional life. I've made a mess of my health because I just didn't take things seriously enough. So today, I want to speak to a, a group of people today. This message may not be for everybody in the room today, and I, I know that going into it, but I feel like this is what, what I need to share with the church today. And I, I want to I talk today to a group of people who you would say that this representation of a hot mess is my personal life right now. Like, if you were to, to define an attractive disaster, my name would be there. Like, what's going on in my world it, it is this attractive disaster. And, and it's to the point where you're not sure that it can even be cleaned up. Not just, not just a little bit of disarray. I'm talking a, a, a big, big mess. The mess is so big that you're not convinced that you even know where to start. Like I, I've got myself into so much trouble. It's so deep right now that I don't even know where to start to climb my way out of this. In fact, I don't even think that I can clean this up on my own. I'm talking to a group of people who might be honest enough to say that the mess that you're in right now, it's your fault. Now, that's not easy to say, but, but I'm talking to a group of people who would, who would recognize the fact that the mess that I'm in right now is because I ignored somebody's advice. I ignored my own conscience. I ignored my parents. I ignored my best friend. I ignored God. I ignored myself because I knew that I shouldn't do it, but I called her anyway, or I took this job that I knew I shouldn't do, but I did it anyways. You've got a messy part of your life. This is, this is who I'm, I'm directing our time together today. You've got a, a messy part of your life, and you're wondering, what in the world am I going to do? I've come to church on Sunday, but when, when Monday morning comes around and I got to roll back into the office, or when I leave here, I got to go face my spouse or my kids right now, I don't know what I'm going to do with the mess that I've made of my life. And if that's you, I do have a bit of encouragement for you today, more than, than you are an attractive disaster. I got a bit of, of hope for you today, and it's this, is that the very mess that you are in right now just might be this magnetic force that draws God close to you. The problem that you are currently facing, the mess that you have worked up on your own, just might be the very thing that allows you and God to become closer than you've ever been in your life. And I don't know about you, but that's what I need when I'm in the middle of a mess. I want to draw your attention to a very obscure passage, passage of Scripture, one that I, you, you probably have never read before. It's found in the book of John, the third chapter. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Let me, let me break this down in the context of what we're talking about today. In other words, God so loved this messy world that he drew near to messy people. I got hope for somebody today that has found themselves in the middle of a mess, that has found your social life, your dating life, your married life, your family life, your business life in the middle of a mess. But it gets better than that. 
because I don't need to just know that I got a mess. See, for many of us, we can't fully understand John 3, 16 until we fully deal with the next verse, verse 17. And I want somebody, listen, I want somebody who has found yourself right now. You find yourself in one of the greatest messes of your life. I need you to understand the weight of this next scripture. You got to hear this. For someone who is a walking, talking Attractive disaster. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he came to save or to rescue or to deliver the world. Jesus didn't walk on this earth to come and point his finger in your face and say, sir, ma'am, I just have come to tell you today that you have made a mess of your relation. Who do you think you are walking onto the earth that, that is mine, making a mess of your life? Shame on you. That's not the Jesus that I serve. That's not the Jesus that I read about in the Bible. Do you realize what a mess you made of your marriage? You are, are, are you a moral? What is happening? But this is the way that some of us view our Savior, that he's, he's come to condemn the world. But his word says that he has not come to condemn the world, but he has come to save the world. I don't know about you, but that's good news that I need to hear on a Sunday. Jesus stepped into the world to enter the lives of messy people, to rescue them from their mess to rescue them from themselves. Because if we're really transparent today, and then this one's gonna sting, I'm just gonna tell you, we are behind most of our messes. It's not the devil. We're good at, at blaming him and giving him a lot of credit. It's not your spouse. Don't look at her, sir, man. Don't look at... No, no, no. We, you and I, are behind most of the messes that we find ourselves in. And when we read the gospel, you see this clear picture, and you see it come to life in so many of the stories. For instance, one day Jesus was in the temple teaching, and the Pharisees, all the teachers of the law, they dragged this lady in who had messed her life up. She had made a mess of her life. You've heard the story. Her reputation is ruined. She's been accused of adultery. Her marriage, somebody else's marriage is messed up. She's destroyed every ounce of reputation that she has, and everyone in her community knows who she is and what she's done. And she's just thrown at the feet of Jesus, and it's very clear in this moment that she is responsible for her mess. After a conversation, I love how Jesus deals with situations like this. After a conversation with her accusers, Jesus stands and he says to the condemned woman, the woman who had totally messed up her life, ma'am, look at me. I, I, need you, I need you to pay attention to what's going on, right? I know what the other people in this room are saying about you right now. I know the conclusions that they have drawn about your life, and I know what they want to take place in your life moving forward. I know what the consequences should be in this situation, but ma'am, I need you, I need you to hear me right now. I have not come, and I do not stand in this moment to condemn you. In other words, he says, I'm not going to sentence you. I'm not going to give you what you might have deserved in your own mess. But he says, ma'am, listen, leave your life of sin. I'm not going to give you what you earned, <laughs> but it's important now that moving forward, that as you leave this moment, that you leave your life of sin. One day, Jesus was in an area of the country that he was um, supposedly not supposed to be in. I love how Jesus just kind of goes and does what Jesus wants to do. And he stops at a well one day. And in the middle of the day when no one is supposed to be out, out and at the well, a woman, probably not much surprised to Jesus, shows up to the well all by herself. A woman 
whose life was no doubt in a mess. She was in a messy situation. She had made a mess of her life. She had been married five times, even by today's standard. That's quite a few, but imagine in the biblical times, everybody knew who she was and what she had been through in life and the the mess that she was in. They knew her reputation. And on top of that, the man that she was currently living with wasn't even her husband. They knew her reputation. They knew the mess that she had made of her life. And this woman appears at, at this well And she meets Jesus by the well, and she knows when she sees Jesus, she immediately understands that that this is is a man from a different culture than me, and we shouldn't shouldn't even be speaking. So she's not expecting Jesus to even strike up a conversation with her, but in essence, Jesus would tell her through the course of conversation, I know the mess that you've made of your life. You don't even have to tell me the details of it. I'm aware that on the outside you may have it together, but on the inside your life is in shambles. But here's what he tells her, and this is so powerful. He says, ma'am, listen, I, me, Jesus, I will quench the thing, the thirst that you've been trying to quench your entire life with broken relationship after broken relationship. I will be a well that will never run dry. And this is the thing, listen, I don't want you to miss because if you become churchified, you're gonna skip right over this. If you become callous by religion, this may not mean too much to you, but I need somebody to catch this today. I need somebody that's been in church for 30 years. I need this to ring true again in your life. That it doesn't matter how messy your life is. It doesn't matter how deep the mess that you've created for yourself and how much of your fault the mess is. What Jesus offered to these messy people, Jesus offers you today. Are you ready? Here's what Jesus offered. Listen, you missed the whole thing. Listen, you gotta listen. Jesus offered himself. Now, I told you, if you become churchified, that's not gonna mean too much to you. Oh, that's great. Oh, praise Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus offers himself to messy people. I don't, come on, church folks, that, that's got to fire somebody up. That Jesus walked into the middle of a mess and says, I am the answer to your mess. Jesus invited messy people, listen, he invited messy people to follow him while they were still messy. He didn't say, oh, you better get that relationship together before you start following me. He didn't say, what? Oh, you better get that addiction under control, and then you're going to be good enough to follow me. No, no, no. Jesus said, you're messy. Oh, you're a perfect candidate to start following me. You find yourself made a big mess of your life. Guess what? I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to follow me. Your mess is the very thing that's going to bring you to an encounter with God. A messy situation. In fact, immediately following the encounter with the adulterous woman, John writes that when Jesus would speak again in John 8 and 12, he says this, I am the light of the world. What is he saying? He says, I can and I will show you a way forward. I can and I will show you a way out of your mess. I can help get you from where you are to a place of unhappiness and frustration and anger and bitterness, and I can get you to a much better place. I am the light of the world. Watch what he continues to say. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me. So what does this imply? This implies that when you made the mess that is your life right now, that you are following something other than Jesus. That when you made a mess of your life, that you didn't get in the mess that you're in right now by following Jesus with every aspect and every fiber of your being. He's implying that that when you made a mess of your life, you got there because you followed something else. You ignored what you knew was right 
You knew you were doing the wrong thing and you did it anyways and now it's a mess. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you follow me, which means you weren't following me when you walked into your mess, but Jesus is saying it's time to follow someone to get out of your mess. Don't follow after your mind. Stop, stop trying to figure it out in your brain. You can't figure out the greatness of our God. Stop trying to make this mess go away on your own. I've got a way out, and it's time to follow somebody out of your mess. Jesus says, you can follow me. I am the light of the world, and the only way to get out of the dark mess that is your life right now is to follow someone who's got more light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I'm the person that can help get you where you need to be, and I'm offering myself to you to quench the thirst that you've been trying to quench with everything else that's led you into the mess that is currently your life. I am the light of the world, verse 12 says. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But here's the key. Follow me. Follow me. Don't follow your desires. Don't follow him. Don't follow her. Don't follow that job. Follow me. Follow me. I am the light of the world. But see, I don't know about you. When I'm in a messy situation and I find myself with the waves of life crashing over my boat, I want a helicopter, Jesus. I want the Coast Guard. And this just happened on Saturday. Somebody told me this, and I had no clue. I want the Coast Guard helicopter to come out, hover right over the mess that I've made of my life. And I'm out in the middle of the ocean just, just trying to keep my head above water. And I want some, some Coast Guard person to lower down this bailout basket. That's the way I'm calling it today. And I, I want somebody who's got all the life vests and all that grace, I want them to put me in that basket. And I want them to hoist me up out of the middle of my mess. And I want them to take me as far away from the mess that I've created on my own as possible. I want to rescue Jesus. Come on, Jesus, I'm in the middle of a mess. I want you to rescue me out of my mess, Jesus. And Jesus says, that sounds great. And I have the capability to do that, but I want so much more for you than to pull you out, pluck you out of the mess that you've made for yourself. He says, listen, see, Jesus never promises that. That's the interesting thing. He never promises that he will come down, pluck us up out of the mess that we've made for ourselves because, listen, we've got consequences that we have to deal with on earth from the messes that we've made on our own. But here's what he tells us. He says, I may not pull you out of it, but I will walk with you through every mess that you've made of your life. And if I am with you, there is nothing that you will not be able to not get through if I'm walking with you. I want so much more than to just pluck. I want to be more than a helicopter savior, a rescue prayer Jesus to you. I want to be in relationship with you. I want to know you. I want you to know me. I want you to know how much I care about you. I want you to know my unending love for you. Following Jesus, listen, following Jesus isn't just asking for advice. It's got to be more than this. God, help me get out of this. No, no, no. But, but, but following Jesus is saying, Lord, I surrender everything to you. When's the last time you've said that? God, I surrender every aspect of my life to you. My decision-making process is yours. My relationships are yours. My business is yours. I give you everything that I have. I don't just come to you when I need something from you. Following Jesus, listen. Following Jesus is a process. Now, some of y'all aren't going to like what I'm going to say in the next few minutes, but we can fight after church. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Following Jesus is not an overnight fix. If it was an overnight fix, guess what? You'd be back in the same situation tomorrow. Following Jesus is a process. Listen, forgiveness is immediate. Please don't question me when I'm talking about I, I understand that. 
You ask for forgiveness and he is quick to forgive. He's a merciful savior. That, that's not what we're talking about here, but you gotta hear me closely. Oftentimes you can't pray your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into. Oftentimes you cannot pray your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into because chances are, and I don't pretend to be a prophet, I just pretend to be human, chances are your mess was avoidable. And I'll go, I'll take it a, a little bit further that you didn't get into the mess that you're currently in by following Jesus. You followed something else. And Jesus right now is inviting you to follow him out. You followed something else to get into your mess. And Jesus says, if you want to get into a different place of living, if you want to get your joy back, if you want to get your peace back, if you want to get your happiness back and your relationship with your spouse back and your kids back, it starts with following me out of this mess. You, you may not be, listen, you may not be able to pray your way out of every mess that you behaved your way into, but listen closely, you can follow your way out. You can follow your way out of the mess that you have made of your life. And Jesus is inviting you, ma'am, sir, who have made a mess of your life, to follow him out. He's not offended by you. He's not come to condemn you. He's come to invite you to follow him to a much better place in life because he sees your mess as an opportunity for you to invite him in. Now I'm gonna ask you to do something, would you stand with me? But I'm gonna ask you to do something in this moment that Jesus asked Matthew, the gospel writer, to do. I'm gonna ask you to do something similar to what Jesus would ask Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Remember Zacchaeus from a few weeks ago. I'm gonna ask you to do something similar to what Jesus would ask the woman that he met at the well that day to do. And it's probably gonna be a little bit uncomfortable. I'm just laying it out there up front. It's not gonna be the easiest thing that you've ever done, chances are. I'm gonna ask a group of people that I've been talking to today who would say, yeah, I, I am an attractive disaster. I'm gonna ask you to do this. I'm gonna ask you to own it. I know that's not easy in a group full of people, a room full of people. I know that that, but I, I'm gonna ask somebody in the room today to just acknowledge the fact that I'm a mess. But here's the key. Today, I'm ready to follow my way out. I've got issues. We don't need to know your issues. It's okay. God knows everything that you're walking through right now. It's about admitting that I don't have it all together. And I am, I am a disaster on the inside, but today, I'm ready to follow the light out of my dark situation. One day when Jesus stopped, he looked up that sycamore tree and guess who was sitting up on the tree? Zacchaeus, you know the story. What does he do? Zacchaeus, the man who had made a reputation of himself, made a mess of his life. Nobody liked Zacchaeus. He was the stealer. He took money out of, his, out of his friends and family's pockets to line his own. He made a mess of his life. And what does Jesus do in a crowd? There was a crowd of people following Jesus. That's why Zacchaeus ran ahead. That's why Zacchaeus ran up a tree. And Jesus, in front of a massive group of people, that all knew who Zacchaeus was, says, Zacchaeus, I want you to publicly, in front of everybody, 
People who know your reputation, I want you to publicly make your way down the tree and publicly follow me to your house. The woman at the well, we know her story so well. Why? John chapter 4 says that she recognizes who Jesus was, that this might be the Messiah that we've been waiting for. Jesus didn't have to ask her to do anything. But what does she do? She sits down and leaves the one thing of value that she walked in with, a lifeline. She leaves her water pail and she runs back to her little village and she meets, she gathers the elders there. And this is so powerful. She gathers them and she she says, gentlemen, listen, I just had an encounter with a man. Now, I know what you're thinking when I say a man. I know, I know. No, 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 listen, hear me out. I know I made a mess in my life. Don't judge me. I, I know I had an encounter. It's not that kind of an encounter. I made a mess of my life, but I just, I had an encounter with a man. And unlike you, he didn't condemn me. But instead, he offered me himself, this relationship with him that would quench every thirst that I've ever had. So I just wonder today if there's any attractive disasters in the room. And when I count to three, I don't want you to be ashamed We all walk through messes. But when I count to three, I wonder if you would have the courage and the faith. There's no fear in your mind, no fear in your heart, no shame and no guilt. No, no, no. I wonder if you would just publicly identify and just slip your hand up when I count to three. One, two, three. Come on, let's see them. Yeah, come on. Lord, we admit that we've got issues that we're dealing with, issues that we have created on our own. Lord, I am responsible for most of my issues, but Lord, in the middle of my mess, we choose to follow you out. And oh, I'm gonna keep praying, and when I'm in a situation, I'm gonna continue to pray, and sure, I need you to help me, but Lord, more than that, I choose to live a life of following after you of giving you everything that I have. For those of you that have never placed your faith in Jesus, let me tell you, today is the day for you to do that. There is so much in a relationship with Jesus, and it starts here by surrendering every aspect of your life. And so if that's you, if you're in a mess and you've never given him your whole heart, right now is an opportunity for you to do that, and I want you to to create your own words. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a prayer, but it's got to come from your heart. It can't come from a preacher's heart. It's got to come from your heart. And I'm telling you, this is going to be the beginning of the most incredible life that you've ever lived by surrendering every aspect to you. So, Lord, right now, God, you see the mess that we are. And, Lord, I'm so grateful that you've not come to condemn us but you've come to save us. You haven't come to point your finger in our face and tell us what failures we are, but you've come to love us. You've come to give us a second chance. And so today, God, maybe for the first time, I give you everything of me. I give you all of my heart. I give you my mind. I give you my family, Lord. Take control of my life. Be the Lord of my life. I'm ready to follow you for the rest of my life. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. Come on, can you put your hands together? Yeah. Come on, there's some people that are making the decision today to follow their way out. I'm not going to pray a rescue prayer. I'm going to follow my way, a life of following Jesus. Now I got good news for you. If that's you, if you just said, Lord, I want you to be in control of every aspect of me, can I tell you that it only gets better from here? This is just the beginning. Listen, water baptism is for you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you. 
God has got so much in mind for you and in store for you as you follow after him. As we close our time out today, maybe you've already made him Lord of your life. Maybe you, that wasn't the step that you needed to take today. But maybe you've never been water baptized. Jesus was baptized publicly. I wonder if maybe that's your next step of faith, is to walk into the waters of baptism and publicly say, you know what, Lord, I don't have it all figured out, but in obedience to your word, I want to identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe that's your next step, and if it is, listen, we've made it really, really simple. Next Sunday, we're gonna be baptizing after each service, and I, I don't want you to miss your chance. We created a slide, this is all you have to do. Who doesn't have a cell phone these days? Who doesn't text more than you talk on everybody? I want you to take your phone out right now and text the word baptism to this number. If you don't have your phone, maybe you don't bring your phone into church, kudos to you. There's a connection card in the seat back in front of you. You can take that out, check that box. We'll be in contact with you early part of the week. We'll get you everything that you need as you publicly follow Jesus with every aspect of your life. Water baptism is for you. And here's the beautiful thing, is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let me tell you, it's for every believer. It's the most incredible thing. If you need power, like the book of Acts talks about, come on. That can happen. You can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a church service like this, or you can have it happen in the bathroom at your house. Be open to everything that God has for you, and you'd be amazed what he'll give you. So let's pray together as we dismiss. Lord, we love you. Thank you for our time together. Lord, thank you for amazing worship. Thank you for opening our hearts and talking to us through your word today, Lord, as we publicly admit that we've got some issues. But more than, more than a rescue prayer, Lord, we're, we're ready to live a life of following you. Bless us today and give us a great rest of the week. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. We'll see you in the house on Sunday or online on Wednesday night. God bless you.